I work all day and get half drunk at night. Waking at four to soundless dark, I stare. In time, the curtain edges will grow light. Till then, I see what's really always there. Unresting death, a whole day nearer now. Making all thought impossible, but how and where and when I shall myself die. Arid interrogation. Yet the dread of dying and being dead flashes afresh to hold and horrify. So runs the opening stanza of Larkin's unforgettable swan song, Obard. Peter Ackroyd called Larkin our national connoisseur of mortal terror. Anyone who has read poems such as Obard, The Old Fools, Ambulances and The Building, to name but a few, uh, will recognise this to be true. Is there any poet of the 20th century who grappled with our fear of ageing and extinction with such unflinching honesty? Larkin claimed that the fear of death remains a sort of bluebeard's chamber in the mind, something one is always afraid of. Age 32, he declared to Patsy Strang, the passage of time and the approach and arrival of death still seems to me the most unforgettable thing about our existence. But naturally, it preoccupied him more as he grew older, watched his mother die in a care home and looked after Monica Jones. I will tease out uh, some of these representations of mortality, adducing Thomas Hardy as a point of comparison. Not the most comfortable topic, uh, and certainly a, a total sea change from the witty speech we just heard from our keynote speaker, uh, but certainly a topic of universal importance. As Larkin observed in Nobard, there is nothing more terrible, but also nothing more true. I'm interested in the fact that Larkin and Hardy were drawn to Christianity, but ultimately rejected faith. This begs the question of how they made sense of death in a heavenless world. From a secular perspective, uh, can we even imagine death as anything other than the end of imagining itself? Moreover, how does death influence how we live? Is it a call to arms to be kind while there is still time, as Larkin put it in the mower? Or does it render our daily efforts futile? I will finish by looking at afterlives, considering what form of immortality, if any, Larkin, uh, sorry, poetry afforded Larkin and Hardy. So let's return to Larkin's inner funk about death poem, as he called Obard. Published in the TLS in 1977, the poem confronts the existential threat of death from the intimate perspective of Larkin in his bedroom, staring into the soundless dark at 4 a.m. Critics such as Robert Palmer uh, have argued that Obard is much more a measured philosophical statement than an agonized emotional one. The poem does meditate on different arguments uh, about the fear of death with a lucid and rational tone, yet this characterization may not necessarily resonate. Lucidity doesn't cancel out emotion, but distills and intensifies it. There is a confessional clarity to Obard that makes it all the more chilling. The stillness and even strange sensuality of images, such as hold and horrify, create a sense of quiet terror. And the deadpan tone, gallows humour, and aphoristic sayings later in the poem, uh, such as being brave, lets no one off the grave, uh, do not undercut, undercut but amplify this. Moreover, the poem is written in the first person and in the, first, uh, in the present tense. Larkin is not opining on death in the abstract, but the particulars of how and where and when I shall myself die. There is bewilderment in these emotional crescendos, such as not to be here, not to be anywhere, and soon, nothing more terrible, nothing more true. The mounting anaphoras and accelerating pace inject a sense of urgency into the poem. Death is not only personal, but imminent, and the, the breathless edition and soon makes that clear. It recalls a sentence uh, from Middlemarch, when the commonplace, we must all die, transforms itself suddenly into the acute consciousness, I must die, and soon, then death grapples us, and his fingers are cruel. So, the dread of dying and being dead. It is striking that Larkin distinguishes uh, between the process of dying and the state of being dead, uh, as highlighted by the comma and the line break after dying. The former quite obviously leads to the latter, but both have their particular brand of fear. Kingsley Amos once recalled, on first reading these words, I at once remembered a conversation that ended with Philip saying, I'm not only frightened of dying, then shouting, I'm afraid of being dead. I will take uh, the, two, the two in turn, if I may. So what is dying for Larkin? 
Is it our final days or hours on that green evening when our death begins, as he considers in continuing to live? Is it a longer period of decline, described with devastating force as a hideous inverted childhood in the old fools? Or perhaps dying starts before this, from the instant we are born, Larkin observed in nothing to be said that life is slow dying. Mostly Larkin was interested in dying as a stage of life, uh, particularly towards the very end, that threshold in between life and death. He paints a harrowing portrait of illness and old age, uh, drawing particular attention to the impersonality of some institutional environments. Heads in the women's ward is a brutal case in point, describing uh, women in a semi-comatose state. From the offset, the macabre title conjures an image of heads with no reference to their bodies. The poem continues without any indexicals, listing body parts in a kind of nightmarish affictio. On pillow after pillow lies the wild white hair and staring eyes. Jaws stand open, necks are stretched with every tendon sharply sketched. There is no suggestion of life in the poem until Larkin observes that a bearded mouse talks silently to someone no one can see. I'm sure we can all agree, pretty devastating stuff. It feels uncomfortably voyeuristic to watch these women at their most vulnerable. There is knowing cruelty in the destruction of femininity here too, negating the pretty hopefulness of smiling at lover, husband, firstborn child, and reducing the female form to its failing body parts. Larkin was afraid of dying in the sterile atmosphere of a hospital. These are charged places where we go to defy, uh, but also to give in to death. Um, and just this sense is captured in poems such as The Building, a struggle to transcend the thought of dying. A thought of dying, but not the reality. The hospital death is a relatively recent phenomenon, and Ernest Becker wrote about this in his 1973 book, The Denial of Death. We used to die at home. A priest and doctor would visit the house to administer last rites, uh, both medical and spiritual. Larkin invokes this in the poem Days, which imagines the priest and the doctor in their long coats running over the fields. Hospitals and care homes mean that death is taken out of the home, and in some ways this makes it even harder to accept, uh, because dying is something that happens over there. So Larkin feared the physical aches and pains at the end of life, describing his mother's last months as scarcely livable. He also writes about the psychological landscape. We are familiar with The Old Fools and its depiction of uh, deep confusion, mental fragmentation. The people in the care home are physically present, but mentally they are an inhabiting an imagined version of the past. That is where they live, not here and now, but where all happened once. This is why they give an air of baffled absence, trying to be there, yet being here. The Winter Palace, written one year after Abad, is also about the forgetfulness that accompanies age, but it provides us with a much more positive perspective. The pacing is swift and the tone light, the last two rhyming couplets take on a more reflective turn. It will be worth it if in the end I manage to blank out whatever it is that is doing the damage. Then there will be nothing I know. My mind will fold into itself, like fields, like snow. The last line makes sense of the wintry title with the softness of its alliterative F and S sounds, gently aspirated rhythm which mirrors the cyclical imagery, like fields, like snow and the sensual movement of folding and doubling. It lulls the speaker into the peace of unknowing, relinquishing control even over his own mind. Winter as a state of hibernation, the snow blanking out reality, recalls the wasteland. T.S. Eliot wrote that winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow in this vast modernist poem written in the year of Larkin's birth in 1922. The Winter Palace touches on a paradox in Larkin's thinking. The speaker imagines and even longs for a state of diminished consciousness that will release him from the fear of aging and mortality. But more often than not, Larkin was troubled by the concept of not being conscious of death and decline. This is reflected in his dismissal in Obard of specious stuff that says no rational being can fear a thing it will not feel, not seeing that this is what we fear. Not being able to feel fear is precisely what terrifies him. Not only is there no sight, no sound, no touch or taste or smell, but we have no faculty to acknowledge this loss in the first place, nothing to think with. There is a similar struggle in The Old Fools, 
their inability to recognise their situation is more disconcerting than the situation itself. The power of choosing gone. The Winter Palace provides us with a much gentler take on forgetfulness. The prospect of losing one's faculties is more distressing than the reality, uh, which often brings a form of peace. It's difficult for those around the person, but actually the person is at rest. The state of discomfort in growing old or indeed actively dying is not as existentially disturbing as the concept of oblivion. Larkin would have begrudgingly agreed with the quip by Maurice Chevalier that old age isn't so bad when you consider the alternative. <laughs> so why is oblivion so frightening? In part because it is difficult to imagine in any sustained way and therefore difficult to accept. How can you make your peace with something when you don't know what that something is? The wording being dead strikes at the heart of the matter. The vital life force of the verb being is negated by dead, and yet it seems to strain against it, especially in its gerund form. It is counterintuitive to imagine the state of actively and continuously being dead. It is also impossible to triangulate death. Although we must all die, we can never know what another person's death is like. Larkin acknowledges this in The Old Fools, remarking that in death, the bits that were you start speeding away from each other forever with no one to see. This remark with no one to see has two meanings. There is no one to see when we are dead, but there is also no one to see us in death. So it's profoundly isolating. In some manuscript pages torn from a workbook in 1945, so traveling back in time a little bit, Larkin wrote, and yet, but, but after death, there's no and yet. This observation touches on the conceptual difficulty of death. We structure our lives in relative terms, always leading up to something or looking back on something. And Larkin explores this in poems uh, such as Next, Please, or Triple Time. And yet we are living towards death, which in itself defies time. Obard plays off this paradox that death both structures and collapses time. We can hypothesize about the spatial and temporal particulars of how and where and when I shall myself die, but never imagine the state of oblivion other than the negation of what we know already, not to be here, not to be anywhere. The full force of death evokes Henry Vaughan's deep but dazzling darkness. Death is shrouded in darkness, but when looked at directly, the mind blanks at the glare. In order for us to function on a daily basis, it must stay just on the edge of vision, a small, unfocused blur. The poem addresses the various ways in which we deny death's existence. According to Larkin, this is religion, but also distractions and, and alcohol. The first line establishes modes of denial according to the time of day. I work all day and get half drunk at night. And this is echoed later in the poem. Realization of death rages out in furnace fear when we are caught without people or drink. Larkin captured a similar sense of blank shock in The Mower, a late unpublished poem of 1979. The first day after a death, the new absence is always the same. The fabric of the world is ineradicably altered, even when the victim is a hedgehog that Larkin saw in his back garden, fed and then accidentally killed while mowing the lawn. Burial was no help. Next morning, I got up, and it did not. The stark simplicity of this monosyllabic statement has a childlike quality to it. Where did it go? A living entity has become an inanimate object in a single moment, and observations like these bring us back to the source. There is no life after death in Thomas Hardy's cosmology either, but oblivion holds much less horror for him. His approach is typically marked by a sad acceptance of the inevitable, and he tends to reframe individual death uh, in terms of cosmic renewal. The dead transcribe, uh, sorry, describe their transfiguration into other forms of life in voices from things growing in the churchyard, for example, while Hardy depicts a ruddy human life now turned to a green shoot in transformations. Death is not life ending, but life changing. Hardy was fascinated by the idea that the dead continue to exist in the imagination of the living, and I will finish by considering questions of remembrance. We only need to read poems of 1912 to 13 to find that memory has the power to resurrect. Hardy wrote the sequence of elegies following the death of his wife Emma in 1921 after 38 years of marriage. In many ways, Emma is more vividly alive to her husband than when she actually lived, particularly towards the end. 
Years of emotional estrangement fall away. She appears as she was at first, dressed in her original air blue gown. This outpouring of grief not only remembers, but in fact renews their love. The idea of a future second death was important to Hardy, and this wording comes from the to be forgotten, in which the deceased cry from their tombs, oh, not at being here, but that our future second death is near, when with the living, memory of us numbs, and blank oblivion comes. Blank oblivion does not refer to the end of individual life for Hardy. The definition is expanded to include the death of memory. Larkin takes a very different approach. In the 2003 programme Philip Larkin, Love and Death in Hull, Martin Amos claimed, it's no small thing to have been one of the great English poets of the century, but that was, like everything else, coloured by death. Being remembered as the poet he is, he would have said, it's going to be no bloody good to me because I'll be in my grave. <laughs> there is certainly truth to this. The annihilation of the individual ego is the most important thing for Larkin, after all. But is it quite so categorical? In his 1956 statement for DJ Enright's anthology, Poets of the 1950s, Larkin claimed that poetry allowed him to act out the impulse to preserve experience indefinitely. I write poems to preserve things I've seen slash thought slash felt, if I may so indicate a composite and complex experience, both for myself and for others, though I feel that my prime responsibility is to the experience itself, which I am trying to keep from oblivion for its own sake. He suggests that by writing poetry, he is setting up experience to be renewed by others in perpetuity. It is a curious idea as if the experience itself can exist independent of his own mind. Time and again, he echoes this sentiment. In a 1982 interview with the Paris Review, he outlined his poetic credo. You've seen this sight, felt this feeling, had this vision, and have got to find a combination of words that will preserve it by setting it off in other people. For a poet so appalled by oblivion, a poem becomes an act of preservation. And that surely is a form of immortality, a reaching towards eternity, even as Larkin himself must fade into the ether. Thank you.